Greetings from Miami. I'm Phil Rosenfeld, and I'd like to share with you the evolving clinical impact of swept source OCT imaging. None of the work I'm going to show you would have been possible without the outstanding efforts of my clinical research fellows at Baskin Palmer and my faculty colleagues. I'd like to thank Ricky Wong's group at the University of Washington, Seattle for their wonderful hardware and software development. And of course, the scientists and engineers at Carl Zeiss Meditech. Here are the important take home messages. Swept source OCT imaging has transformed my clinical practice. Swept source OCT angiography has replaced dye based angiography for most of my patients. The killer apps for swept source OCT and geography are wide field imaging for diabetic retinopathy and the detection of treatment naive non exudative macular neovascularization. This is the instrument we've been using, the Plexalite 9000. Most of my scans were done at 100,000 A scans per second, but now the instrument's been upgraded to 200,000 A scans per second. The current scan patterns are three by three, a six by six millimeter, a nine by nine, a 12 by 12, and we have a 12 by 12 montage, a 15 by nine, and we also have a 15 by nine auto montage. And now, most recently, we have a 15 by 15 scan. So here's an example of a patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion. You can see the small three by three scan, 10 micron spacing between A scans and B scans. And the same patient, we have a six by six scan, a nine by nine scan, a 12 by 12 scan, and a 15 by 15 scan. And this is just showing you how beautiful these images look, whether it's a high definition 12 by 12 scan or a 15 by 15 scan. So I use swept source OCT as a screening tool for my diabetics looking for microvascular changes in macular edema. I screened for neovascular abnormalities. I follow the response to treatment and I predict color fundus imaging will replace fluoros and fluorescein angiography, which have been the gold standard, will be replaced by swept source OCT angiography. So here's an optos color image. Here we have a fluorescein. You can see the neovascular lesions here. And when we compare the color and the fluorescein side by side, and then we look at the wide field swept source OCT and the vitreoretinal interface lab, you can see all the areas of neovascularization. Plus you get the B scan so you can see on cross section, in this case in particular, the neovascular front of the disc and the tractional detachment to the macula. So here we see everything at once. We see the macular thickness map, the flow map, the B scans, patient gets PRP and anti-VEGF therapy, and you can appreciate the macular edema going away, the neovascularization no longer being detectable. And six months later, the patient's doing really well, and you don't have to repeat a fluorescein angiography. You don't even have to repeat a fundus exam, okay? So it's useful for diabetic macular edema and neovascularization elsewhere on the disc. So we needed a prospective study. So here, here we have a fluorescein compared to OCT angiography. So we wanted to compare fluorescein to swept source OCT, and we needed to identify these sentinel vessels and determine if swept source OCT was as good as fluorescein. So one of my colleagues, Jonathan Russell, who's a red resident, got his other co-residents together and they brought together 20 eyes of patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. They performed PRP and they performed OCT angiography one week, one month, and three months after the PRP was applied. But fluorescein was only done at baseline in three months, but we could repeat OCT angiography at all the interval time points, okay? So here's a color, here's the fluorescein showing all the neovascular lesions, here's the 12 by 12 and the vitreoretinal interface slab, again, identifying all the neovascular lesions, okay? Here's a case with the 12 by 12 slab identifies most of the lesions, but what you really need is a 12 by 12 montage. It identifies so many more lesions. Here's fluorescein at baseline in three months. And look at this three-month montage. It's beautiful. It shows all the neovascular lesions. And not only that, you can follow these lesions over time. And you can see how the neovascular frond along the superior arcade is going away. And you can see over time at each interval visit, it's melting away. And you have the B scans and you have the ONFOS images or you can also look in this other case, how more and more neovascular complexity is increasing over three months, which is a warning sign that maybe retreatment is necessary. So they identified all the neovascularization on fluorescein, they then identified it on OCT angiography. In the same field of view, all the lesions were identified. 
And I think that's pretty well demonstrated in this study that you can monitor patients and follow their response to treatment. And now this has been repeated in three other studies. So I think the results can be believed, all right? But how about a wider field image? So this is a wide field fluorescene. You can see the neovascular fronds and 12 by 12 does a pretty good job as you can see here on the actual OCTA montage. But maybe a montage would do even better. And these are simulated images that are put on the fluorescene, but they were also obtained so we can compare how well they represented the simulated images. So what they did is they collected over a thousand patients, over 1200 fluorescenes, and they identified 651 eyes with just proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And they created these simulated 12 by 12 and simulated montage images. And they found that by placing them onto the fluorescene, they could identify 98.3% of the eyes with neovascularization on these simulated montages. And this is just an example of patients with simulated montages and the real montage. Here's another one, a simulated montage and a real montage. But occasionally you miss a lesion, you can see nasally here. Well, then they came up with the idea, what if we performed the montage centered on the disc rather than the fovea? As you can see here, as you can see here, yeah, you still miss a few, but when they did it on all the patients that had had fluorescein, 99.7% of the neovascular lesions were identified. So to adequately manage proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it isn't necessary to, to identify all the neovascularization. You can identify most of them, and we call these sentinel vessels. And just imagine how useful it's going to be when you have a 15 by 15 millimeter scan. Okay. So now let's talk about AMD. These are eyes with drusen. Occasionally in Western AMD, drusen volume increases. Occasionally they go away, but most of the time it goes on to neovascular exudative disease and atrophy. And with anti-VEGF therapy, we're seeing more and more atrophy. So here's a case with drusen. Comes in, 2040 vision, not really complaining about much. On spectral domain OCT, you can see the elevation of the RPE, the RPE map. And then suddenly, four months later, comes in with a hemorrhage. Could this have been predicted? Look at the subretinal blood here. Could this have been prevented? Well, we now know that these eyes with dry AMD harbor what's called subclinical non-exudative macular neovascularization, and it can occur in eyes with drusen or geographic atrophy. All right, and we reported this slab that we use to identify most of the neovascular lesions. We call it the orc slab. It goes from the outer retina to the chorea capillaris. You can see these lesions sitting under the double layer sign. You see the retinal projection artifacts. We can remove them, and then we can outline the area of these lesions. And these algorithms were applied to everything that I'm going to show you. And you can identify type 1 and type 2 lesions this way. You can identify type 3 lesions, around, and you can identify polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So we reported back in 2016 that swept source OCT angiography is as good as ICG angiography for identifying these lesions. And we did a study looking at patients with dry AMD in one eye, wet AMD in the fellow eye. We studied them beginning in August, 2014. And we followed the eyes with dry AMD because they were higher risk of exudation. The follow-up visits through 2018 and the follow-up was variable because anti-VEGF therapy was needed in the fellow eye. After one year in 160 patients, if you had these subclinical lesions, you had a 15-fold increased risk of exudation compared to eyes that didn't have them. And in 227 eyes over two years, a 14-fold increased risk of exudation, all right? So overall, the prevalence of these subclinical neovascular lesions is 13.2%, and it doesn't matter if it's in eyes with drusen intermediate AMD, or late AMD. So this is one of my favorite patients, dry AMD, 2020 vision. Notice on the B scan, there's a double layer sign here, okay? On ICG angiography, there's this plaque, okay? Here's the plaque blown up three by three. Here's the B scan, double layer sign, okay? And there's the B scan with flow, and you can see flow in this double layer sign. And here we have a side-by-side -side comparison between the ICG plaque and the swept source OCT angiographic image, okay? We followed this patient for 27 months in the study, no exudation, okay? So the lesion grew, but growth does not mean exudation, okay? 
we continued to follow this patient for an additional 31 months, last seen in October. Lesion slowly getting bigger, but no exudation. Now here's another case, case number two, irregular retinal pigment epithelial detachment. We thought they were drusen. No, this is a double layer sign, okay? The ones on the side are drusen. And this is what the ICG angiographic plaque looks, look, looks like. Here's the B scan with the flow, the pink inside what we thought was a druse. That's a double layer sign. This is what the side-by-side -side comparison of the plaque and the ICG angiographic image look, looks like. We followed this patient for 20 months and the lesion grew but there was no exudation, okay? Growth does not mean exudation. Then two months later, a little bit of fluid, we observed the lesion grew a little bit, and then a month later, more fluid, symptomatic. So we treated, the fluid went away, and we continued to follow this patient, all right? And over a period of 10 months, six anti-VEGF therapies, you can see on the three by three and six by six scan, the lesion grew, not really, but the patient did really well, even though there wasn't a change in the size of the lesion. So we continued to follow this patient for an additional 32 months, only one anti-VEGF therapy, 29 months since the last injection. This is what the patient looked like in November. The lesion's getting bigger. The PED is getting smaller, okay? But we're not treating because growth doesn't mean you need to treat. It doesn't mean there's exudation. Here's the Cap Kaplan-Meier plot, looking at the subclinical lesions, risk of exudation, 21% at one year, compared to eyes that don't have the subclinical lesion, 4%. Here we're looking at two years, subclinical lesions, the risk of exudation, 34%, versus 7.3% if you don't have it. That represents almost a 14-fold increased risk of exudation. And it doesn't matter if the eye has intermediate AMD or geographic atrophy. And we've looked at all sorts of parameters prior to exudation. It's not the growth of the lesion size compared to baseline. It's not the growth just prior to exudation. It's not the size of the lesion. It's not the change in the choriocapillaris flow deficits. We and other groups are looking at all sorts of other possible anatomic changes. The volume and vascular complexity of the lesion, the flow velocity within the lesion, the flow velocity within the choriocapillaris, changes in the choroidal blood blood flow. But we think there's an immunologic trigger that causes exudation. So back to our patient, came in with this big hemorrhage. Could this have been predicted? Yes. Here we have the images from our patient. This. These are three different subclinical lesions that we identified in this patient. And there were double layer signs associated with each of them. We were worried. We wanted the patient to come back in March, but she canceled because of COVID-19. We rescheduled for April, but she canceled because of COVID-19. And then she came into the emergency room in May with sudden vision loss because of this hemorrhage. We knew this was gonna happen. I call this a COVID-19. 19 casualty because she was afraid to come into clinic. Could this have been prevented? Yes, with better follow-up. So important take-home messages. Swept source OCT imaging has transformed my clinical practice. Swept source OCT angiography has replaced dye-based angiography for the vast majority of retinal diseases. The killer apps for swept source OCT angiography are managing diabetic retinopathy. The wide field imaging is great and for the detection of these subclinical non-exudative neovascular lesions. So I thank you for your attention. I hope you've taken away from this talk the importance of swept source OCT angiography and wide field imaging in the management of your clinical practice patients. Thank you.